This is Duke University. Hello, everyone. I'm Deborah Jensen, um, director of the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. And I could not be more proud to moderate a book watch event on a book so true to John Hope Franklin's legacy. Tim Tyson's book is really a guided tour, hypnotically plain spoken, of a crime of historic not notoriety and symbolic power. That's a quote. We can almost taste the cake and coffee during his interview with Carolyn Bryant at the opening of the book. And although we know that, as the book tells us, the murder of Emmett Till was reported in one of the very first banner headlines of the civil rights era and launched the national coalition that fueled the modern civil rights movement, what we want is the story Tim Tyson did not know. Quote, now she looked me in the eyes, Tim narrates, trying hard to distinguish between fact and rem remembrance, and she told me a story that I did not know. The FHI and Duke Libraries first inaugurated our co-sponsored Book Watch series in 2004 with the expanded edition of Kathy Davidson's Revolution and the Word. I'd like to note that President Broadhead was a respondent for Kathy Davidson's Book Watch event, and that on April 19th this spring, Dick Broadhead will be the next author to be feted for his forthcoming book, Speaking of Duke, Leading the 21st Century University. To our knowledge, Dick is the only member of our community to serve at different times as both a panelist and a featured author in Book Watch, although I'm waiting to be shown that I'm wrong. There have been several other unique cases in the Book Watch series, like J. Cameron Carter's Race, a Theological Account, the only first book we have featured. Almost all of our selections have been monographs, with two exceptions, Meg Greer, Walter Mignolo, and Maureen Quilligan's edited collection on rereading the Black Legend, and Andrew Janiak's digital uh, Project Vox for a book watch looking under the hood of the book. Panelists for Laurent Dubois' recent book watch included a banjo player and an instrument maker. Books, as we know, sing. Let me introduce uh, our, our featured author. Timothy Tyson is senior research scholar at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University and visiting professor of American Christianity and Southern Culture at Duke Divinity School. Previously, he was professor of Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is the author of Blood Done Sign My Name and Radio Free Dixie, Robert F. Williams and the Roots of Black Power. He serves on the executive board of the North Carolina uh, NAACP and the UNC Center for Civil Rights. He has won numerous and diverse awards for his teaching and his writing. Two of his books have been adapted as films and one as a play, and you will feel the blood of Emmett Till reach for the stage and the screen as you read. Now let me introduce the panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. Craig Werner is uh, the Evu Bascom Professor of Afro-American Studies and Chair of the Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His books include A Change is Gonna Come, Music, Race, and the Soul of America, and We Gotta Get Out of This Place, The Soundtrack of the Vietnam War, which was named Rolling Stones Book of the Year for 2015. That has got to be a lot of fun. A longtime member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominating committee, he has won teaching awards on the campus and national levels. With Tim Tyson, Steve Kantrowitz, and Danielle McGuire, Craig Werner led a series of busloads of students from Madison to Chicago, Illinois, Nashville, and then on to Birmingham and Montgomery, Jackson, Hattiesburg, and Duck Hill, and New Orleans to, to explore and discuss their histories. That mobile course was called Freedom Ride, the Sights and Sounds of the Civil Rights Movement. And I don't know how I managed not to be on the bus. But. Then Curtis Austin is a member of the faculty of the Department of African American and African Studies at The Ohio State University. 
There he serves as director of the undergraduate studies program and teaches courses on the civil rights and black power movements. The author of Up Against the Wall, Violence in the Making and Unmaking of the Black Panther Party. His current research projects include a textbook on African-American history and a book covering the history of the black power movement. Irving Joyner is a professor of law at North Carolina Central University School of Law. He is a longtime civil rights activist and presently serves as legal counsel and chair of the Legal Redress Committee of the North Carolina NAACP. He is also co-host of the Legal Eagle Review, which airs on WNCU 90.7 FM on Sunday evenings. So tune in. Adrian Lent Smith is Associate Professor of History, African and African American Studies, and Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at Duke University, where she has taught courses on civil rights, the US and the world, and the politics of respectability. The author of Freedom Struggles, African Americans in World War I, she is currently working on a book about African Americans and state violence in the post-civil rights years. Tonight we're going to begin with something special. Tim is going to do a brief reading. The panelists' responses will begin after that, followed by Tim's response, and then Q&A with you. So, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, and thank uh, Sarah Rogers uh, for all the work she did putting this together, and uh, and the Franken Humanities Institute uh, for, for having us here this evening. I'm, I'm so pleased and honored, and I'm so glad to have all of you here, all, so many uh, dear friends, and uh, among which, uh, just a, a word about our, our panel. Uh, Craig Werner uh, was, taught me how to write books. So blank, it's all his fault, whatever you, you don't like it, you can sit on him, but uh, we've worked together for a long, long time, and uh, I can't tell you everything about Craig, but he's, he's uh, cause that would be, inf that would impair, impair him and possibly me legally, but um, he's the best teacher I've ever seen work. And I had the office right next to his, where you, and in paper thin walls, and the line out the door, and he turned so many, uh, anybody can sort of get A students and shine them up, it's fun. You know, he took D students and turned them into B students. Made them have a good time at college. Intellectual awakening for the first time. Just, I can't, how many people owe their college diploma to Greg Werner is beyond, beyond count. Um, Adrian I, is a brilliant historian whom I believe, my first memory of Adrian is at Billy Bob's bar in San Antonio, Fort Worth, you know, those, <laughs> one of those places in Texas <laughs> where, where we took a long and necessary walk but, and have been talking ever since. And, um, I, and, and I'm very lucky to be her neighbor too these days, uh, and especially Zora and Langston's neighbor. But, uh, and Curtis, uh, I'm uh, so grateful to you for being here. And we go back a long way too. The uh, Up Against the Wall, Violence in the Making and Unmaking of the Black Panther Party. Not the, the really good books on the Black Panther Party, I have in my hand. The uh, marvelous historian and, uh, and, uh, native of Mississippi. I'm really glad, glad he could be here with us. And Irv is my attorney, so he cannot testify against me. <laughs> uh, really a, a, a freedom warrior in North Carolina for now, now uh, maybe f in his fourth decade as such, I'm not quite sure about the math, being a humanities professor, but uh, I, I knew Irv. I knew Irv first in the archive. 
you were a document before you were, you know, before you were a person to me when I was doing Wilmington 10 research and, and the like. And then uh, have been lucky to get to know him in the NAACP and in the, in the Freedom Story more large, large, largely here in North Carolina. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad he can be here too. Our nation's birthplace is not Constitution Hall in Philadelphia, where things were said about the, the, uh, the general welfare and uh, preserving liberty for ourselves and our posterity. I think the, uh, the important word there is ourselves. That's the question. Who is, who is we? And it wasn't the, at, at uh, Monticello in the big house where the man who wrote, we hold these things to be self-evident. Um, where that man, the words that those uh, hand, his hands wrote with a, at the light of a lamp brought to him perhaps by someone to whom he held a deed. Uh, and the mother of his children, quite likely. Um, our, our nation's birthplace is in the abyss. I mean that quite literally. It's in, it's in the Atlantic abyss, where the bones of six or seven million Africans settle into the sand in the enormous death machine while the Atlantic slave trade that uh, built this part of the world uh, as we know it. Um, I think that, uh, and that's where it starts, and I think that's one thing about the Emmett Till story, that why it resonates with us so deeply is because it takes us there. It's a little piece of that abyss. Um, but it's not a Southern horror story, though it's horrific. It's been told that way. It's not, a, it's not a horror movie from the distant, exotic South where terrible things happen, starring redneck Frankenstein. And the problem with that narrative is that it lets everyone off the hook because nobody's redneck Frankenstein. And so we can congratulate ourselves on not being redneck Frankenstein. Well, that sets the bar pretty low, doesn't it? The... Uh, The problem with that horrific story is not that it's too horrible, but is that it's not horrible enough uh, because the truth is much worse. Uh, the truth is that the, ab uh, the abyss is our birthplace and our present is our past. And once, but once we understand that, once we accept that, then I think that the story of Emmett Till actually shines a bright light up out of the abyss. The abyss may be our birthplace, but it is not our home. But if we're to find our way home, we have to see us and we have to see the world around us and clearly, and we have to locate ourselves in that unfolding story of our history, the history that's made us and that surrounds us and threatens to take us back to the abyss if we pretend it's not happening. And it's a moment. You know, there's always his, there's history, and then there's the history that the history historian is ensnared in when he or she writes the history. And our moment and my subject are not unrelated. We've elected an imitation George Wallace Carnival Barker con artist, president of the United States. Um, and I, which ironically, I think, might bring us together. I find when I'm going places, our differences don't make as much difference as they once did. And everyone is interested in the question of what is to be done, um, which is not always the case, which is why we're here. Um, it's so, Trump is so bizarre uh, that it's easy to forget that Trumpism is nothing new, that it's really just the Southern strategy recycled. Um, apart from his singular insanity. Um, this was pioneered by Kevin Phillips, 
and George Wallace and Richard Nixon, Kevin Phillips, who, uh, whose uh, 1969 book manuscript uh, was the playbook for Richard Nixon's uh, Southern strategy in the South, in which he taught Richard Nixon that the key to American politics is knowing who hates who, um, and pointed toward a new base for the conservative movement in the white South, where fear and resentment and rage about the gains of the civil rights movement uh, were, were uh, a promising field for advancement. The uh, attack on black voting rights that, that began uh, real, then has really been started uh, since the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which, of course, we don't even need the Voting Rights Act. What's wrong with the 15th Amendment? The problem is we don't have the, the moral and political will to enforce it. We've got, you know, in, in this state, we've got uh, the federal courts have already said that our, our elections are, are unconstitutional because of a racial gerrymander, in their words, and, and uh, also that the uh, voter suppression law that all these, uh, the, that these elections have taken place under is unconstitutional because it, uh, quote, almost surgically targets African Americans. Um, and, and what, what more evidence do we need to move? Um, I'm almost 60 years old, you know, I've, I've, and I'm, I've watched in my lifetime uh, an attack on Brown versus Board of Education that was successful. We teach the children about Brown versus Board of Education. It's like a medallion of American uh, triumph and morality, and it's, but it's legally dead. No one will, everyone uh, will brag of it and no one will defend it. Uh, I didn't know I was going to be 60 years old fighting for school integration and, and the voting rights. Um, well, what does all this have to do with Emmett Till? Um, many years ago, when I was, uh, uh, as I became a historian without really knowing it, uh, certainly by the time I was about 16 or so I began to discover, as James Baldwin said, that the, the, the difference between a witness and an actor is a much, the line between a witness and an actor is much thinner than I had been led to believe, or perhaps that I had hoped. Uh, I think I wanted maybe a cleaner role in the whole thing. But to be a storyteller is to become part of the story. And the story of Emmett Till has done it to me again. Um, this is not, as I said, a Southern horror story. It's not a black victimization story. It's not a white redemption story. It's not about anybody's exoneration. That is not the point. Uh, it's the way that we go from our birthplace in the abyss to our home at last. In the words of the old spiritual, how we cross over into campground. If the abyss that speaks from Emmett Till's lynching is our legacy, then the light of the power of democratic grassroots organizing that uh, turned Mamie Bradley's private heartache into a national movement that toppled the system that of which Emmett Till's murder was an inevitable byproduct. Um, so by joining in, in Mamie's efforts and marching in those footsteps, by mobilizing the power that's available to us uh, and the prophets and the visionaries and the guiding spirits who precede us and who walk with us still, we can leave our birthplace and find our home. I'm, I'm, uh, they said something about readings. I'm going to read you a page. Uh, and it's not the... It may not be the page that people most want to hear, but it's, uh, it's about where I'm going, which I think is a lot more important sometimes. Uh, James Baldwin writes, the glorification of one race 
and the consequent debasement of another or others always has been and always will be a recipe for murder. It also remains a recipe for toxic self-hatred. The ancient lie of white supremacy remains lethal. It shoots first and, asks, and dodges questions later. White supremacy leaves almost half of all African-American children growing up in poverty in a deindustrialized urban wasteland. It abandons the moral and practical truth embodied in Brown versus Board of Education and accepts school resegregation as a given despite the fact that it is poisonous to the children of the poor. Internalized white supremacy in the minds of black youth guns down other black youth who learn from media images of themselves, peddled by corporations, that their lives are worth little enough to pour out in battles over street corners. White supremacy also trembles in the hands of some law enforcement officers and vigilantes who seem unable to distinguish between genuine danger and centuries-old phantoms. To see beyond the ghost, all of us must develop the moral vision and political will to crush white supremacy both its political program, but also its concealed assumptions. We have to come to grips with our own history, not only genocide, slavery, exploitation, and systems of oppression, but also the legacies of those who resisted and fought back and still fight back. We must find what Dr. King called the strength to love. New social movements must confront head on the racial chasm in American life Baldwin instructs, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Our strivings will unfold in a fallen world among imperfect people who have inherited a deeply tragic history. There is no guarantee of success, but we have guiding spirits who still walk among us. We have the courtroom of historical memory where Reverend Moses Wright stands still and says, there he is. We have the boundless moral landscape where Mamie Bradley still shakes the earth with her brilliance and her courage. We have the bold voices of the Black Lives Matter movement demanding justice now and reminding us to remember Emmett Till, to say his name. We have the enduring NAACP and the Interracial Moral Mondays Coalition spreading out of North Carolina like the sit-ins once did, and dozens of other similar crusades across the country. We can still hear the feet, marching feet of millions in the streets of America, all of them belonging to the children of Emmett Till. Greg? Uh, it's always great to be in the Triangle area. Um, as I always say when I'm here, uh, I want to begin by paying homage to the fact that I am a part of an intellectual lineage that comes back to the Triangle, but unlike most of the many, many scholars who go back to Duke or Carolina, uh, my roots are North Carolina Central, where one of my uh, dissertation advisors, Richard Barksdale, was a longtime faculty member before he moved to the University of Illinois, and I want to... Uh, uh, pay homage to him uh, in his memory right here. Since I got to uh, the airport uh, a little over 24 hours ago, Tim and I have seen uh, the James Baldwin film, I'm Not Your Negro, twice. Uh, so uh, I get the feeling that Baldwin is sitting in about four of those seats uh, in the front row uh, there. And uh, I'd written these notes before, and then I'm watching it, and in the first 10 minutes of the movie, you uh, get Baldwin writing to an agent about a book that he's working on. Uh, and he says, yeah, I know what I need to do. Uh, I know how to put this book together, but now it's a matter of research and journeys. And when I heard that, uh, I started thinking about the path that leads to the blood of Emmett Till and to Tim's other work. So, and I want to start by sharing an anecdote from early in the time that I knew Tim, shortly after he and Perry and Hope and Sam moved to uh, Madison. Uh, he, they moved into a house about a mile, a little over a mile away from where I live, and I uh, had to bring a form over to him. I think it was something trivial, like he had to sign it, get paid, which is a detail uh, he's not always good about. Uh, Perry will attest to that. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, it took me, I don't know, maybe five minutes to get over to the house. And I got there, knocked on the door, and nobody came to the answer. And knocked again, it took a couple minutes, and finally I just said, well, hell, I'm going to go in. Uh, and when I opened the door and went in, there was Tim frantically trying to untie himself from the desk where he had put himself to do his research. He had like literally tied himself there so he couldn't wander off. Uh, um, Damn. <laughs> you remember that, man? Why did I invite him here? <laughs> um, but I say that partially because Tim writes so beautifully that it's probably not clear uh, how uh, the journey is not always an easy one uh, for him. But the important thing is that it is a journey, and I mean that in the Baldwinian sense. It's an exploration of the places where the political and the personal meet. Uh, his writing reaches for a deeper understanding of the stories we tell, how we tell them, and crucially, how we, individually and collectively, respond to those stories. They help us think about the questions of the ways that the stories we tell shape and create and test who we are and who we want to become. I thought about that as I was reading the first wave of responses to the blood of Emmett Till. Uh, if you've read the Vanity Fair review, it's a fair uh, representation uh, of uh, many of the reviews at this point. Uh, and I have to say that I've never been so disappointed by positive reviews. Uh, they're all glowing. Uh, they're all saying, terrific book, important book. And they mostly miss the point. They all start with the hook, right? Carolyn Brandt talks. The woman in the case has uh, spoken. Uh, I shouldn't have been surprised by that. It was obvious. It is a hook. Uh, no question about it. Uh, but most of those first responses left it there. They treated the book like it's an individual story. They highlighted the aspects of, I'm not sure it's quite an apology, but the way in which Carolyn Brandt recants a little bit of the story that was ascribed uh, to her, that she says nothing he did uh, deserved it. Um, I distrust apologies. I profoundly distrust apologies. In I'm Not Your Negro, there's a montage uh, in which uh, they include uh, everybody from Richard Nixon, uh, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and uh, 45. And I'm with Lawrence Fishburne on this one. I won't say his name unless I have to on this. And that's a matter of giving power to the demon. If you've got a demon, you've got a contingent reality that presents itself as an absolute reality. And it wants to be named. It wants to be honored. And I refuse to do that unless I have to. Since the election, whenever the name enters my mind, I simply exhale it and say, out of here. Get out of here. We need that energy for other things. That's the point here. We don't feed the meme, you know? Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, it's got claws. Uh, but they're made out of mush. Anyway, many of the reviews made Blood of Emmett Till, at least implicitly, a book about white conscience. You know, they highlight the stunning reveal here. Uh, never mind the fact that anybody who's been paying any attention to this story at all for any period of time already knew that the version that she said was a bunch of lies. I'm happy she said it, you know, good, but nothing new there. Didn't change anybody who cares since of what was going on. And I want to emphasize that Tim was aware of this risk from the very, very beginning. The first time we sat down and talked about how to put the book together, uh, and you just said it again repeatedly here, you know, we knew that the Emmett Till story is in our public memory as a Southern horror story. It's a Gothic, right? It's the redneck Frankenstein uh, story, and that's a useless uh, story. Um, it's a story that's told again and again to make uh, northern white liberals feel safely distanced from uh, the reality, something that Baldwin came back to again and again and again. And Tim shaped and reshaped the book. He thought and rethought uh, the book. Uh, and it was, from the beginning, it was clear you can't reduce the story to 140 uh, characters. It needs the context. And most of the first reviews simply treated it as if the context wasn't there, uh, which it is. And, uh, they, what those reviews included just might as well have been tweeted. But the good news is that they put uh, Blood of Emmett Till on the bestseller list. People are buying it. And if they buy it, and if they read it, it tells the story in a way that has the potential to change lives, to make a real difference. And I want to emphasize several aspects of that. Number one, even the central story 
the Emmett Till story isn't really about Carolyn Bryant. And there are ways in which it's not really about Emmett Till. Of course, it is about Emmett Till. But uh, it's about much more than that. It's a story about white supremacy. It's a story about the culture that made the Emmett Till story archetypal and inevitable, fundamentally. If it wasn't Emmett Till, it was going to be somebody else. It was going to be somebody else really soon. Uh, it's a story about the Brown versus Board of Education decision, you know, which is utterly a myth. You know, nobody in Chicago or Milwaukee believes we're in a desegregated school uh, world today. It's a story about white refusal to abide by the law. It's about the deeper stories of histories of sex and race and murder. It's a toxic brew there. If you're looking for the central figure of the blood of Emmett Till, it may well be Judge Tom Brady, the white supremacist judge, very respectable man who breathed the fire, who spit out the venom, who gave the speeches, wrote the books that made what happened in the immediate aftermath of Brown absolutely inevitable. Tom Brady and those like him killed Emmett Till as surely as anybody in the Bryant or the Milam plans. But there's a second story that Tim tells, equally crucial. And it's a story about resistance. It's a story in which the central figure may well be Amzie Moore, and he stands in for other people there. But the, one of the uh, key figures of the Mississippi underground, the community of black activists, the local people who built the networks in the wake of World War II, who fought for voting rights acts, who died. Tim tells those stories in this also. And those built the networks that came to life in response to Emmett Till. When Reverend Moses Wright stood up in that court and offered his witness, he didn't stand alone. There were a lot of people standing with him there, and that's absolutely crucial. The Blood of Emmett Till is also a story about how that underground spread, about how it expanded the context of resistance, about how the money that was raised in response to the Till case at labor union rallies in black Chicago, in churches, was used to fund the Montgomery bus boycott, was used to power those early days of the movement when it was changing Americans. It's important we not forget that. A lot hasn't changed, a lot has. It's a story about the headlines in Jakarta, Nairobi, and Tehran. It's a story about the need to expand our consciousness of the horrors. I think Black Lives Matter has been pretty good about that. It's not just what happens right here. It's what's happening in the much larger context there. And one of the good news is here about the book is that the reviews are getting better and deeper. Uh, Sherry Azar Fosley's review in the Los Angeles uh, Times book review is a knockout. Uh, look it up and read it. He talks about how Emmett Till's death is his death. He puts this exactly in the context of what is happening around us. Uh, today. And that underlines one of the crucial points of Tim's work that's been there from the beginning in different ways, uh, which is its response to William Faulkner's statement in Absalom, Absalom, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. As Tim writes in the brilliant last chapter of The Blood of Emmett Till, we are yesterday and today and tomorrow still killing Emmett Till. It's not a Southern horror story. It's an American story. It's our story. This is an abstract to me. In Madison, Wisconsin, about as blue a city as you can get in voting terms, on Williamson Street, about a mile and a quarter from where I live, from where Tim lived the last few years uh, there. Over the last 10 years, there have been three police killings. Greg Velasquez, Tony Robinson, Paul Heen. One black one Latin, one white, all complicated. But it's a story of the killing of Emmett Till. It's going around in my neighborhood right now. Ultimately, what the blood of Emmett Till does is it forces us to put ourselves in the story. It's about the ways we choose how we respond to the stories. Recognize where we're complicit decide whether we resist and what we do. Thank you.
Good evening to all of you, and thank you so very much for uh, coming uh, to uh, this event. Uh, I guess to some extent this could be likened to a, uh, a funeral uh, in which people gather to mourn the, uh, the past and the passing. Uh, quite frankly, I was pretty pissed with Tim uh, for writing this book. Uh, not for writing the book, but writing it in the way that he did. Um, I was uh, raised in the South. And uh, with each page that I read, it uh, revived memories that I had. And I was one of those who uh, had a copy of the original uh, edition of Jet magazine, which... Uh, showed the funeral of uh, Emmett Till and was very conversant with the story from uh, what was then the Norfolk Journal and Guide, which was the African-American newspaper that circulated in uh, North Carolina uh, that described what had happened uh, to, uh, to Emmett Till. So the story of Emmett Till was not new. Uh, and Tim is a brilliant writer. Uh, he has captured this in its rawest form. And, and with it caused me to relive a lot of the things that I and other African Americans experienced right here in North Carolina. Because while the blood of Emmett Till focused on Mississippi, the exact same story can be told for North Carolina, and South Carolina, Georgia. And the parallels are really eerie. Uh, Tim talks about the uh, Great Migration out of uh, Mississippi. Uh, that brought Emmett Till's mother from Mississippi and the family from Mississippi into Chicago, which was the migratory trail of African Americans coming out of Alabama and Mississippi. And that trail is still very evident today. For North Carolina, that migratory, tra migratory trail was Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York where my family traveled at around pretty much the same time. And the rawness of the story or the history that Tim unearthed is the attitude and the mood and the context in which this killing occurred but replicates all the other killings that occurred that did not receive the notoriety of, uh, of an Emmett Till. Um, everyone knew what the code was. Uh, you knew that you could not look white folks in the eye. You knew that you couldn't touch a white woman. And you couldn't even look at her in any manner. And you knew what the consequences were if you did. Uh, that, that was something that was ingrained in us from an early age. So you knew the rule. You knew the rule. Uh, Emmett Till visited from Chicago wasn't the first time that he had 
visited. I was uh, myself caught in the traffic between New York and North Carolina, where I, for the summers, would go to New York and back to North Carolina during the, uh, the school season. And you knew that when you got to New York, the rules were different than they were when you were below the Mason-Dixon line. And in fact, riding the bus, you knew that there were places that you could sit on the bus below the Max Mason-Dixon line that you didn't have to sit when you were above the Mason-Dixon line. You could get on the bus in New York on the front seat, but by the time you hit North Carolina, you had to be in the back of, uh, of the bus. And you knew that white folks, not, not, not a couple of them, but white folks knew that they could take liberties with you at any time. And that nothing would happen. To, they knew it. And you knew it. They knew it. And you, you could not rely on law enforcement. Because in many instances, law enforcement was the perpetrator or collaborators in the, the prosecutors who became persecutors of African Americans. And so Tim regurgitation of that context brought that back. And I would read a chapter and then I have to get up and walk to shake it off uh, because it just, uh, angered me uh, to have to revisit that because you can grow numb. <laughs> you can, over the years, you grow numb to that if you've had that experience. You've gone north, you've gone up the way, and you've gotten a better life uh, where you can sip on some Chardonnay. You, 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 you grow numb to being down in those dusty streets and roadways and in and out of those stores and around those people who meant you no good. I remember my grandmother telling us that you go straight to where you're supposed to go. And you go quickly. You don't tarry out and around. You don't just wander out because you might not come back. You might not come back. Uh, you don't go into the store by yourself. You, you, you don't. Those are the rules. Those were the rules. And, and you knew them. And if you followed them, you had a chance to survive. But for African Americans, they didn't want to run that risk. Therefore, the Great Migration. Because as soon as they graduated from high school, the next day, they were on a Greyhound bus or Trailway bus headed north. Or in the case of Mississippi, headed to Chicago or to Detroit or to Cleveland, which was a part of that migratory um, trail. I'm reminded of Aaron Henry and Medgar Evans and uh, George Lee who gave their lives to this movement, they, they knew what was going to happen to them. They knew that they were in danger, but yet they stayed and they fought because they had fought for America. And when they came back here, they were determined that they would fight in America. And they fought. And they were strapped. I mean, they, they, they weren't guinea pigs. You know, they, they, they were strapped. Every, me, Reverend Lee, <laughs> they, they carried guns with them wherever they were because they knew at any time they might have to use them. They were not afraid to use them. It wasn't a question about nonviolence. It was a question of survival. The question of survival. I can help my people if I survive. 
They weren't offensive. But as they used to say in the streets, you got to bring butt to get butt. <laughs> you got to bring it to get it. And if you bring it, <laughs> uh, then we, we, we'll be ready. We are not going to start it. But if you do, we're going to put an exclamation point in it. As described in the book, say, black blood may run down these streets, but white blood will flow as well. And that wasn't unchristian. That, that, that wasn't sacrilegious. That wasn't designed to be a black power advocate. But it was designed to survive. It was designed to survive so that they could help their people. And, 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 and Tim, the, the rawness revised all of that in my memory and in my recollection. I, I recall my first contact with Tim was through his book, uh, Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. Oxford, uh, Ben Chavis, who I was intimately. Uh, involved with, and, 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 and Tim portrayed the rawness uh, there as he did here, as he did with his writing of the Wilmington Ten. So you need to read this book, but you need to suck this in because this is not a history. This is an experience. This is an experience of the way of life that African Americans had to deal with in, uh, well, still today. Still today. Same thing. Different names, different streets, same thing. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, thank you to Tim for allowing me to be a part of this <laughs> event. Uh, I wasn't mad at Tim when he wrote the book, but I did wonder why he was writing it. I thought I knew the story. I was pretty sure I knew, uh, I knew the story, and then I read it. And um, all I can say is my lectures are much better now, and my students... <laughs> My students really like me. Uh, so I also want to thank the uh, people at the Franklin Humanities Institute for putting this together and getting us all here uh, on time. Um, this is really, it's, it's a tremendous book. You, should, you definitely should read it. But in thanking Tim, I want to thank him for setting us all straight, starting with me on, on the importance of Emmett Till and what his death did in laying the foundation for what became the most transformative mass movement of the 20th century. Um, the, the title of my talk, I don't know if you got a chance to see, see it, but it's called, I Know It Was the Blood. And you know, it's the blood of Emmett Till, and I'm saying I know it was the blood. And so I wanna say a few words about that title before I go on. I took the title from a gospel song that I heard while I was growing up in Mississippi in small, Delta Town of Yazoo City. And it was a staple in the church where I went and every other church my mom um, forced me to go. Uh, it was one of those songs that would make the person with the hardest hearts shout for joy. And so I thought it was fitting for tonight's presentation because it encapsulates, um, in theory anyway, the experiences of millions of black Americans, North and South, East and West, in the aftermath of the heinous murder of Emmett Bobo Till. Uh, and so I want to play a really short clip for, uh, for you, for those of you who haven't heard this song and don't know what I'm talking about. I know at least one person does because I heard him say, well, and that's what you're supposed to say if the song is fun. So just really quickly, bear with me. I know it was a play. Yeah. 
was a plan. I know it was a plan to save me. But one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was a plan to save me. But wait a minute. So you get my point. Uh, and so I'm saying I know that that it was, and I want to explain that to you uh, now, because blacks did feel as if they were lost. They couldn't really articulate it, but at the death of Emmett Till, they realized that that's what they were. They were completely lost, and this blood, this death, this murder helped them to find themselves. So I remember that song like it was yesterday. I use that as a springboard to go off into the rest of my remarks. And I like this song because a significant number of people, I would say most people who entered the black freedom struggle, uh, did so because of the value they placed on the blood of Emmett Till. And I can just tell you, I was raised in one of those uh, good but strict Christian homes um, where I was taught that no person living or dead is more important than Jesus Christ. And so let me say for the record, just in case my mom watches this, that uh, I'm in no way equating the death of Emmett Till with the death of Jesus Christ. I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to suggest that many thousands of black Americans credited Emmett Till's death with saving them from a life of acquiescence to oppression and from a lifetime of internalized inferiority and from an existence circumscribed by fear. I'm not only referring to those blacks in Mississippi and other parts of the South where inequality and degradation were codified into law, but about blacks all over the country. These individuals took Till's murder as a sign that the time had come for them to take action to secure the freedom that they and their ancestors had prayed and hoped for for so long. So just to give you a really quick example, I'd like to uh, I'd like you to listen to me closely. Um, I'm going to quote to you from a, a woman in Mississippi. Her name is B. Jenkins. B. Jenkins. She's a little-known Mississippi native who simply grew tired of her people's mistreatment in Mississippi's closed society. And she made it clear that joining the movement was a deliberate act of conscience when she told one interviewer about the impact of Emma Till's murder. She recalled, and I'm quoting now, she recalled that she heard that him and some more boys passed by this store, a white store, and the owner of the store accused him of whistling at his wife. And that night, they went in to take him from his grandparents. And they were screaming and hollering and asking and begging him, please don't take him. And they just took him by force and carried him out and brutally murdered him. Just about every part they could cut off of him, they did that. And I was just so filled up with that and other things where they had been so brutal to our black people. And when that evening came, I went back to the field. I was picking cotton. I just fell down on my sack. And I asked the Lord, Lord, why? Why, it happened, why does it have, have to happen to us all the time? We have to take this brutality. We haven't did anything. Why? Why, Lord? So, so you can see that, that B. Jenkins truly believed uh, that the Lord was listening to her. And she truly believed, as she told this interviewer, that the Lord spoke to her as she lay in that cotton field, and he commanded her to work in the service of her people's freedom. When she was finally able to raise herself from the ground, she stood up a new person. And at that moment, she decided she would give her life to the cause of liberation for her fellow black Mississippians. And despite the terror that reigned in the Magnolia State throughout the late 50s and early 60s, she kept her promise to the Lord and began working as an organizer. And while much of her work was underground and therefore secret in the early days of her activism, she joined SNCC in the early 60s and later became active in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which succeeded in 1968 in forcing the Democratic Party to allow black participation in state and national political uh, conventions. And this participation eventually led to a major sea change in American race relations. So yes, I know it was the blood of Emmett Till that saved B. Jenkins from living the rest of her life in fear of what might happen if she dared exercise her constitutional right to speak truth to power 
simply because she wanted to escape the drudgery of plantation life in the closed society that was Mississippi. Before that sea change took place, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals, saw the now famous photograph of Till's mutilated body. While some saw the photograph in black newspapers like the Pittsburgh Courier or the Chicago Defender, most blacks saw it in Jet Magazine. The story of Till's death in association with such a horrific image devastated black America. There were, however, those like B. Jenkins who took the death as a clarion call to vigilance. Not least of these was a small time hoodlum named Alprentis Bunchy Carter who lived in the Watts section of Los Angeles, California. Like many urban youth at the time, Carter gravitated toward the gangs that inundated both black and white neighborhoods of South Central Los Angeles. And though Carter would eventually rise through the ranks to take on a leadership role in one of LA's largest gangs, known as the Slossons, in the 1950s, he remained what most people would consider small town. An avid reader, Carter learned of the freedom struggles taking place in various corners of the world after the end of World War II. He was particularly impressed with the anti-colonial movements developing in Africa and Asia. Not one to keep secrets about what he read, Carter conveyed to his fellow gang members how deeply interested he had become in the countries that organized and participated in the Bang Dom Conference, which was a 1955 meeting, a few months before Till's murder, 1955 meeting of newly independent Asian and African states. Bang Dung's insistence on the respect for human rights and an end to colonialism pricked Carter's interest and led him to seek out more information. Carter had long harbored a secret desire to rescue blacks from the violent racism that kept them poor, segregated, and uneducated. And as he read more, he soon discovered that the African nation of Kenya was struggling to rid itself of colonialism and to gain its independence from the British. He became particularly enamored with the Kikuyu Land and Freedom Army, which was the peasant-led resistance movement that sparked the popular uprising against the British. Popularly known as the Mau Mau, now you've heard of the Mau Mau, you know what the Mau Mau is. The Kikuyu Land and Freedom Army helped break the British resolve to continue as Kenya's colonizer. And while the Mau Mau suffered tremendous losses and was ultimately defeated militarily, its willingness to fight fire with fire persuaded England to dramatically alter its relationship with Kenya. In other words, they left. Not long after learning of these international developments, Carter was reading his mother's Jet magazine. And y'all who remember back then, it wasn't the house's magazine. This is your mom's or sometimes your dad's magazine. and You can't really be caught with that thing. So it was his mother's magazine. And he was stunned when he read the article and saw the image of Emmett Till's grossly disfigured corpse. Carter decided on the spot that he would never rest until he pursued his dream of becoming a freedom fighter. Working hard to convince his fellow gang members of the necessity of a group that would do the same thing as the Mau Mau did in Kenya, he soon garnered several recruits. Now, unfortunately, Carter's gang-related activities stopped his fledgling political activity and landed him in prison after a burglary conviction. But prison proved to be a godsend for Carter because it allowed him to pursue his passion for reading. He educated himself not only about the unfolding of the world right struggle against colonialism, but he also became intimately familiar with fellow prisoner Eldridge Cleaver. When Carter told Cleaver of his reaction to Till's murder, Cleaver encouraged him to continue to recruit people to his cause. In the intervening years, the two became close associates, and after the Muslim minister Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965, they both vowed to create an organization that would honor Malcolm's memory. Upon their release from prison, Carter and Cleaver agreed to follow through on the formation of Carter's long-held dream of forming his own Mau Mau. And Carter subsequently became the founder and leader of the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Ultimately, this former gang leader, affectionately known as the mayor of the ghetto, was able to politicize and recruit hundreds of his old gang buddies to this new organization. He also carefully built an underground movement that he originally named the Mau Mau. And he made it a point to inform most of the members of this underground that Till's unpunished murderers had set their organization into motion. Carter's Mau Mau, which later evolved into 
the Black Liberation Army had started as a direct result of his reaction to the murder of Emmett Till. Very closely related to Carter's Till-induced transformation was the transformation of Marine Sergeant Henry Jones. In the late 30s, Henry Hank Jones left his native home of New Albany, Mississippi, and settled in San Francisco with his family. After high school, he joined the Marines and wound up in Korea. Completely apolitical before he entered the Marines, Jones quickly discovered that racism and discrimination had followed them to the Far East. And like so many other soldiers, Jones spent much of his downtime reading letters from home and catching up on all the news that he had missed while he was away. One day, he read a newspaper article about the death of Emmett Till. And though it angered him, it wasn't until a fellow Marine showed him the pictures of Till's body that a light flicked on inside him. Once again, that photograph. Jones told one interviewer that that was the day he decided he would no longer tolerate racism and the violence that was often used to perpetuate it. In short order, Jones and his fellow black soldiers found themselves in dozens of fights with white soldiers who brought their racism to Korea. He recalled that the day after they saw the photo of Till's battered corpse, they got so fed up with being silent about the many instances of racism that they faced in Korea that they put the word out that any whites who dared show their faces in the local clubs around the military base would be dealt with. Apparently, a number of whites refused to take the threat seriously, and as a result, several were found battered, broken, and bruised by this contingent of black soldiers who saw themselves as the avengers of Emmett Till's murder. And according to Jones, the white soldiers got the point and eventually stopped coming into the downtown area of the base camp when they knew that Jones and his crew were out and about. And Jones also eventually comes back to San Francisco and joins the Los Angeles, I'm sorry, the San Francisco chapter of the Black Panther Party. And he told one interviewer that had it not been for Emmett Till, he would never have dreamed of taking on the task of working to end racist oppression. So my major point here is that Tyson's blood of Emmett Till helps us to clearly understand that Till's death and the acquittal of his killers prompted thousands of local blacks to act on their own behalf to end the state of Mississippi's overtly racist ways. Not only that, the blood of Emmett Till provides an impressive array of evidence proving that the political organizing that took place in the wake of this tragic murder might not have been sustained had it not been for the tireless efforts of Mamie Mobley who spoke to tens of thousands of people about the importance of not allowing her child to die in vain. And while groups like the NAACP and later CORE and SNCC picked up the baton from the courageous men and women who had mostly worked underground during the 40s and 50s to free black Southerners in the days, months, and years prior to Till's murder, it is important that we understand that Till's murder snatched people out of their comfort zones and forced them to pursue Patrick Henry's dictum of liberty or death. Because for many, the only outlet had been to talk, to cry, a curse about their daily oppression. Teal's murder made it clear that the time for talking had ended and the time for action was at hand. And this was especially the case for those who viewed themselves as having been in the same generation of Emmett Till. And even though labor unions like A. Philip Randolph's Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and the more militant United Packing House Workers of America led, supported, and financed the burgeoning movement in the early years. After Till's death, it was younger people who remembered the story of Till's murder and the gruesome photo who propelled the movement to new heights. When they came of age, five and 10 years after Till's murder, many made a vow to use his death as motivation to secure black freedom by any means necessary. So it's safe to say that Mamie Mobley uh, had Mamie Mobley, I'm sorry, chosen to have a closed casket funeral for her murdered son, the world would never have witnessed the birth of organizations like SNCC and the Black Panther Party. It is highly doubtful that black newspapers, black publishing com com companies, black churches would have taken the risk to agitate so forcefully against Jim Crow had it not been for the fact that a child was murdered in cold blood and his killers, though they confessed the crime, walked free. So I submit to you tonight that I know it was the blood of Emmett Till that brought the nation and later the world into the realization that freedom ain't free and that someone has to pay the high cost of freedom. Perhaps Thomas Jefferson put it best when he wrote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. 
And while we know today that Jefferson qualified as a patriot to his country and as a tyrant to people he owned as chattel, we have to admit that his point has a lot of truth to it. A good number of black Americans, perhaps unfamiliar with Jefferson's views, did indeed seek to shed the blood of those they viewed as tyrants during their bid for freedom. And like that of Nat Turner, did Mark Vesey, Martin Luther King Jr., Viola Liuzzo, the blood of Emmett Till refreshed the tree of liberty and helped it to blossom into the civil rights and the more radical black power movements of the 60s and the 70s. And as a black child, born, raised, and educated in the state of Mississippi, I can say without equivocation that I know it was Till's blood that saved me from a life of misery, poverty, and unrestrained racist violence. Thank you. with going last is that everybody has already said all of the things that I plan to say. But some things bear repeating, so I'm just going to say them ahead of time, or say them again. Before I do, I'll make a couple of prefatory comments. One is to say that I'm looking at this room and thinking that I see the village that helps me raise my children sitting in here, the mayor of whom, Perry Morgan, is sitting right there. You might have heard of her husband, Tim Tyson. He's sitting right there. Um, and, that, and the note that Deborah Jensen talked about, this sort of, this, this may be the only instance of particular people who've been involved in the book watch and then involved in something else in an, another way. Laurent Dubois, a recent author who participated, might be the only participant who was involved in a book watch and then followed it by babysitting for a participant um, in the next book watch. He's watching my kids right now. So if you're watching the live stream, thank you. Um, and then the other, um, the other thing I'll say as a prefatory comment is that one of the things, and this is not related to my comments here, but one of the things that um, Tim's book taught me as a child of Atlanta who's been claiming that the Tom Brady who lives in Boston was the worst Tom Brady, um, he might very well have be the second worst Tom Brady. <laughs> um, that's been walking around out there. Um, so this actually does sort of reiterate some of the points that, um, well, that Tim began with and that folks on the panel have made. Um, and I'm going to talk, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested actually in this, how we um, individually and collectively respond to the story. And so I'm going to think about that for the next few minutes. I titled my paper, A Lament for Emmett Till and for All of Us. Um, and I did that largely because I've been very struck in how the public at large has responded to this book and in some ways misread and misheard um, a lot of what's in this book, as, as Craig mentioned. And it didn't even occur to me to think about this until I started getting all of these emails in my inbox from my older sister um, who lives on Twitter and knows that I have a flip phone and so does, do not. Um, and she kept forwarding me all of these articles, reviews, tweets, words of mouth, expressions of horror, um, of people calling out their pain um, about the Emmett Till story and in response to their understanding of that story. And one of the things that the voices kept saying that I found really odd, honestly, was it turns out she lied. Carol and Brian lied about what happened in that general store in Money, Mississippi. And then people would go on, after having said this, to talk about in great detail their tears. They were weeping. They were hurting because the Tibbs book had reminded them of the horror of this story, because Carol and Brian's lies had called up to them the horror of the story. Uh, and in some ways, that's an incredibly human reaction, right? It is horrible. It is outrageous. It is terrible. And yet, there comes a point when you get enough ambient expressions of internet sorrow, when you begin to wonder, like, what on earth is going on right now? Um, and I actually, at some point in one of my days of exhaustion and short temper, actually said out loud to the internet, today, is the day that you decided to cry for Emmett Till? The boy died 60 years ago, right? Um, 
I think one of the great values of Tibbs' book is that it does bring Till's death back to us as an immediate and as a searing pain. And it does so with an eloquence and a broad-reaching humaneness that I marvel at and envy. Um, the murder of Emmett Till has always undid me. It undid me as a kid. It undoes me. I'm doing it now. It undoes me as a parent. Um, and Tim's recapturing of the cruelty of it all, of the immediate moment, of the sweetness of him, of all of it, um, was at times so hard that I actually had to close the book and walk away. Um, but one of the other strengths of the book is that it gives you a reason to come back, right? Because a history book should do more than just make you confront something. It should make you work to understand the how and the context and the consequence of it. And one of the things that you get in reading the book, as I think Curtis did a really nice job of laying out, is the broader sort of both the, the effects of Till's death and people being mobilized by it, but the larger context in which it was happening. Right, because Ibit Till is not the first child who'd been murdered, nor was the murder of a child or the murder of some people the first moment in which a generation of people or a cohort of people were mobilized to act and to fight against Jim Crow. But in this post-World War II moment, right, in this, in this Cold War an anti-colonial moment when Mississippi's economy had opened up and labor needed to be controlled in different ways instead of the way that it was, there was space to take that gener generational mobilization and do something more with it. And so understanding when Till's murder was and, and what happened when people worked to make meaning of it is necessary for us to understanding understand both the specificity and the long reach of the histories that we, that we deal with. Um, so that's that. I'll say that the teal, tears on some level also, um, at some point, began to make me angry, honestly. That, and I will say that in the past few months, I have been less generous with humanity than I used to be, um, <laughs> and, and short on patience. But there came a point when, taken in the aggregate, um, the national outcry, what became an almost rote expression of pain, began to seem to me exculpatory, right? That people were saying, we are innocent because we weep. And I have little sympathy. I have no sympathy, actually, for those exculpatory tears. And maybe that is ungenerous of me. Or perhaps some people wept precisely because we are not innocent. Because, as MLK said, we are all somehow guilty and, and sort of implicated in the death of Emmett Till. Um, but the mourning for Emmett Till to me all over social media in the opening months of 2017 did seem awfully like um, people were holding awake for a past that they hoped to be soon buried. Um, in weeping for Emmett Till, the criers seemed to be asking for a redemption, to borrow phrasing from historian Rene Romano's wonderful book, Racial Reckoning, redemption um, that the nation had not yet rightly earned. Um, I suspect in a lot of ways that um, Tim has a more generous spirit than I do on this one, more optimism than I do in a lot of ways. He is, after all, son, grandson, brother, cousin, nephew to a host of ministers, right? So brother-in-law, redemption is their stock in trade, right? Um, and, and it used to be, I remember actually, this is, I remember reading um, Dan Carter's The Politics of Rage about George Wallace, who I will say has one thing over 45 in that at least he worked as a politician and began as a New Deal Democrat. So some part of him at some point understood that the federal government could work for public good. Um, but I remember reading that book and thinking, you know, stories of redemption used to always make me cry. But I am never crying for George Wallace again, right? That was my, my takeaway from that. That I actually, you know, I save redemption for the Lord to meet out. Um, and I am not so eager to give it to people myself. Um, that was just a little mad tangent. I actually forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but I will say that alongside redemption is the, a notion of innocence, right? And the other thing, again, as the panel has said, one of the things that blew my mind in the public response to this book um, was that people said, oh my God, she lied. It turns out he didn't do the things she'd said that he'd done. Um, and maybe one of the effects of being an African-American historian um, and a historian of African America um, is that you stand really close to human venality for like up close and personal, um, which is basically what studying the history of white supremacy in the US and elsewhere is. And you forget that other people don't. So things can shock them that often don't shock me anymore unless they come at me from the side and surprise me instead of directly on. And I thought to myself, what on earth did you think she'd done? You know, not even just because she was a bad person, but because she lived within a system and with people and within structures that demanded that she lie, right? I mean, you know, just, it struck me as a slightly, the, sh the contemporary shock struck me as so absurd to be almost insane. Um, but it is something to have her admit that she lied. And her shame and self-pity in making that admission in some ways felt like salt to me on an open wound. But I asked myself, why did the public even need that admission, right? In addition to who, like wondering who didn't already think that she lied, I wondered, what would it have mattered if she hadn't? been lying, right? What might Emmett Till possibly have done that would have merited kidnapping him in the night, that would have merited terror, then torture, then murder, right? Um, never mind our innocence then, why do our current narratives, our expressions of shock, need Emmett Till to be innocent? Um, for me, this question is a question that is deeply contemporary. Right? I think like many people, I can no longer extract Till's story from the more recent murders of black children, um, like Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, to name but a few, and just really the sort of first few that the internet brought to, I keep talking about the internet like it's a person, but you know what I mean, that the internet brought to sort of public attention. Their deaths haunt me. I think about them often. And they trouble me with a question how have we gotten to a point in this country where we can murder a child in the streets um, and relabel him a criminal and have people say that the act was regrettable, but perhaps it was on some level justifiable or necessary? Till's death reminds me that we haven't just gotten to that point. We have returned to that point, um, maybe even regressed past that point. Um, Till's death energized a social movement that led to structural change, um, but not without casualties there too, as Tim points out. Um, and in its wake, we have seen white supremacy, which is always protean in its nature, retool itself in the face of that structural change. And now with the federal government opposed to its own past reforms. So the question is, as the invisible man asked and Lenin before him, what is to be done? Um, I'm gonna end this lament with an appreciation for two people who emerge in a book um, filled with remarkable people, Mamie Till, Till Mobley um, and Mose Wright. I hope to never know the kind of pain and guilt um, that, they, that they felt. I certainly can't imagine having the kind of wherewithal and courage that they demonstrated. Um, I'm gonna tell you in closing the moment of my most rawly honest moment in class that I've ever had. I taught an article on Mamie Till Bradley um, and it was really about how she'd turned her son's death. She'd, she'd, make it, she'd, she'd made it political. She'd turned her pain outward to make it do more than just be her suffering. And one of my students who I swear is a good kid no longer a kid, this was a long time ago. He's probably, I don't know, old enough to run for president at this point. Um, but he, he was a good person, but not necessarily the most articulate of people 
and not always the most sensitive. And in this class, he said, I mean, I don't know. There's a way in which Mamie Till Bradley just sounds like a drama queen. And I, who was back from maternity leave with a son who was months old at that point, and I wasn't sleeping much, so this part of my normal judiciousness that I'm so proud of was gone. But I leaned forward in the seminar table, and I said to him, you need to understand something. You need to understand this, that if I sent my child somewhere and thought I had prepared him for the worst thing that could possibly happen, and instead something worse than I could have reasonably imagined to have happened, had happened, do you know what I would have done? I would have killed someone. I would have killed someone. And I don't think that is an uncommon response. And the room was silent and terrified, <laughs> as you can imagine, um, before the student went, yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, and so my point in telling that to my student was to say that there's nothing obvious or inevitable about the fact that Till's death would become the thing that mobilized a generation. It became that, as um, Tim beautifully points out to us, because his family made it so, and because the people who listened to them, who saw those images, took it and did something with it in a moment where the conjuncture of sort of broader um, or sort of historical arrangements made that possible. In doing so, Mamie Till um, Mobley forged a path not just for the young activists for whom Till's death was a political awakening, but also for Leslie McSpadden, mother of Michael Brown, for Sabrina Fulton, mother of Trayvon Martin, and for the other mothers of the movement who have, as one article described, turned their sorrow into a mission to ensure that no other parents have to join their sorority of heartbreak. That, my friend, seems a far more useful response than tears. Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd much rather uh, talk with you than at you. Um, that's not true, but I'm saying that <laughs> being the, as, as Adrian pointed out, being the uh, son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-great-grandson and onward of uh, a long line of Methodist and free will Baptist preachers. I do want to say one thing and just sort of in response to all the really compelling uh, thoughts that have been shared, and I, I have watched your faces, and I, I know that you feel like I, I do. Um, this is a lot of illumination, um, a lot of a lot of power. Um, if, and this is something about my uh, my whole career. I just want to say, and and I don't. I ain't never set out to write To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm not uh, saying that African Americans have not been oppressed. I'm not saying that I don't care about that. But I'm saying that my life is not about the drama of the white conscience. It has never seemed to me the point. That may be an important subject between uh, me or you and God and our soul, but it's not, I don't call, think that's the moral center of this story. And uh, and it's one of the things that's kind of uh, made me uneasy about all this focus on Carolyn Bryant's, did she really repent? How, you know, but, you know, it's just, it's what we, it, and we've always got the crucifixion. I mean, We've always got the, I mean, this, uh, Leonard Pitts uh, wrote, uh, this country's history is a seething river of unpunished blood. This is not the morning news. We've always got, got, got that. And 
the question is just what do we do with it? You know, I mean, it's the resurrection. You know, can you find resurrection in, in crucifixion somewhere? What do you do when they take the best thing you've got and set it on fire, or drag it behind a truck, or hang it on a tree? What do you do with it? Um, and that's, that's, that's a profoundly important, and it's really not just an individual question. That's a profoundly social question. It's a, it's a, it's a profound question whether or not What are we going to, can, can, I, what I'm saying is that we continue to live in a crisis in America, crisis of democracy, and now really a, a powerful, perilous crisis of democracy that is rooted in the politics of race. It goes, to, it goes beyond the politics of race, but it certainly cannot get there without going through the politics of race, and I'm not sure that any place it goes is clear of the politics of race and that it doesn't and that it threatens our, our very possible our very hopes of a decent and democratic country um, so that's the point of the story of any of these stories that i've tried to tell um is is otherwise it's just trivia I don't, I'm not interested in uh, nostalgia of pain. You know, I don't see any point in that. I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. I don't, you know, guilt is guilt of, about the past is like the, you know, that's the worry. It's what guilt is to the past, what worry is to the future. You know, there may be some point to it, but it's really not. It's not adequate. It won't it fill the bill, and you've got. To go well beyond that, it's, um, so uh, I'm. Uh, yeah. Anyway, maybe, maybe y'all got some questions or comments or brickbats. Or We're filming this. Um, if anyone has, <laughs> if anyone has any questions, we request that you uh, uh, speak into the microphone. Okay, well, I'm still kind of uh, talking about this because you said you didn't want to talk about guilt, but, um, and it's also in response to the last speaker. Um, so I uh, just recently, um, a couple days ago, taught Night and Fog. I don't know if any of you know that part. Mm -hmm. Holocaust, um, and um, the students were very moved by the film, and um, we talked about it, and it's a quite diverse uh, group of students, uh, white, African American, Latino, and um, we talked about this issue of guilt, and I guess a question that I have, and I, as a, as a Jew whose father escaped uh, the camps and his whole family was killed there. Um, uh, as a white American Jew, uh, I do feel guilt for the crimes that my country has committed against the black people in America. And I, I can't, I, I, I guess I do feel that guilt. I just, I, I guess I don't know how to uh, not feel that guilt then. I guess my question is, um, is it, is it, do you really think that there is no use to having guilt? I mean, I think uh, it, guilt can sometimes push us to action. Um, or is there some other way to deal with, I'm not saying that guilt is the only thing that we should feel, obviously, uh, but, but um, isn't, is there any use to guilt? I mean, is it, I don't know. I guess that's just that's the question. I'll say, I think guilt is a for a white person becoming aware of American history. I think guilt is an almost inevitable response. 
So is rage. I've watched just now, you know, 30 years of white students go through introduction to Afro-American history and just get mad as hell. Mostly at high school or their parents. Like, this is not a small matter. Why was I not told this? Why am I, you know, 18 years old or 19 years old and I, I've never heard anything about this? And the, the, the rage, that's another thing. Um, but I think that uh, uh, one problem, it, Ta-Nehisi Coates says, uh, says the, that uh, the essence of white race politics is self-exoneration. And I melt, I've meditated on that a little bit. And I think that has a deep truth to it. And it's not just among the sort of pro progressive or well-meaning, you know, the, what Martin Luther King called people of goodwill. Um, uh, there was a, I, here's a story from Introduction to Afro-American History. I believe it's day two, <laughs> Wednesday, <laughs> some years ago. So I'm teaching at that point the Atlantic slave trade. It's the enormous death machine that I refer to. It's not a pretty story. It's a hard, that's a hard lecture to give and it's a hard lecture to listen to and, and it's uh, an absolutely necessary uh, place that you have to go to teach that history. But uh, I watched this, this young man sitting there with his baseball cap on backwards. Uh, young white man, and he's uh, getting more and more agitated and more and more agitated. And then finally, you know, in this three quarters of the way through this horrible story, his hand shoots up. And I said, yes, yes, what, you know. Uh, and he said, yeah, but affirmative action, I had, made, I'd, I had sent him through the whole thing. He felt guilt. But then guilt sours into resentment. Mm -hmm. Like, how about that friend of yours who says, you didn't call me. Why haven't you called me? You never call me. It's like, I'm sorry. At some point, it's like, yeah, and I ain't never going to call you because <laughs> you always make me feel bad. You know, your friend who says, you know, when it, who's always, it's always just like last time, even though you haven't called her and you don't know her birthday. That's just the truth. <laughs> you know, but still, you know, she makes you feel free, and she loves you, and that, and you do return that, and so you're at, you're at liberty in that situation. But guilt can lead you in a bad place uh, of resentment. It will, I think, event inevitably. The other th bad thing is, before you get there, a lot of liberals feel guilty, and it's like a, it's like an activity. And and then after feeling guilty. They feel kind of good because they've kind of they feel like they've done something. Damn it! They took a, they were sitting there and they watched the m movie and they feel felt awful and it, you know they took a position. I'm against it. Well, congratulations. <laughs> uh, you know that was a long journey, wasn't it? <laughs> that's, I know, see, I'm I'm not being very nice, but that's because I've been through this, you know. And but it's been a while, but. Uh, so, yeah, good things can come up, and I think it's an inevitable response. But, it, you know, it's like shame. Uh, Audrey Lord said that guilt is the white problem, shame is the black problem. Right? And that doesn't, that's not a fruitful, that's no place to stay, you know, for anybody, for any reason, really. Uh, so, it's not enough. That's the main thing. Let me add some on yeah, that. Uh, can Audrey Lord, uh, was in a class that I was teaching at one point, and uh, somebody asked a question, very much the same kind of uh, struggle that you spoke here. And what she said, she made the point on guilt and shame. Uh, and she said that the problem with both of those is that they keep you looking backwards. Uh, and that the struggle is to make them part of a process that places responsibility for the next step you take moving forward. So I think that's the real answer. It's not easy emotionally. Yeah. But yeah. It, it doesn't freeze you there. You can use that response as, some, as somewhere to go. And I would just add to that, that think of it as like a shot of adrenaline. Like sometimes you need it to like wake you up or like 
lift the car off of your cat or whatever it is that adrenaline does. But if you keep it surging, it'll actually kill you, right? Um, the other thing I would say is that in my experience as like the integrating Negro in how many um, situations, my, that in my experience, people who feel guilty look at the injured party, look to the injured party to absolve them of that guilt. And that is wearying, right? So part of it is fig let, let, like, let these moments of guilt or even shame shake up, shake you up so that you start questioning what you're seeing or what you're doing and what's happening and then quickly move out of that shake to something else. Mm. Yes, yes, at the back there. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, good. very good. Good. You never know. Um, I know the feeling. I've, I've interested in the conversations that were had with the publishing industry regarding the titling of this book. It's pretty rare that the author gets to make that choice. Um, so there's that. And just the reaction of all the panelists to the title. The, um, the, the, the one thing that embarrasses me about this title is that it's got, it sounds like I'm writing a blood trilogy or something. You know, there was blood done sign my name, now there's the blood of Emmett Till. Well, I tell you what, next, there ain't the blood of nothing. I'll just tell you that. I was embarrassed about that because I'm, you know, I'm, I, it's not like I'm trying to, but it, the blood series, it's just that, um, and what, and this is very different because Blood Doesn't Sign My Name, Craig played, that's, it's an old song, and Craig played it for me in the Department of Afro-American Studies one day, and it, we weren't 30 seconds into that song, and I knew that's the name of that book that I'm going to write someday about, you know what, the one I can't the one that sits in my desk drawer for the last 12 years. And uh, I knew that was the title. And th but then when I got in through a happenstance and divine intervention, uh, got up with this publisher, um, they basically, the publisher told my editor, rename the book, whatever you call it, you will not call it Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. And she did not tell me that. She just wouldn't call, let me call it that. The right man, and this is after it's over. I'm done writing it. I feel great. Whew. Lay my burden down. She says, oh, there's just one last thing. We can't really call it Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. I'm like, no, no, there is one last thing. We are going to call it Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. And then that, we had a shouting match for three months, I would say. Just sometimes quietly, sometimes, but really, it was a shouting match. <laughs> Only once or twice, kind of literally. But uh, the, and she got a job at another press, <laughs> Heck, right? And, but, exactly. <laughs> and that's the only reason that book's called Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. The new editor that showed up said, "I looked at all your correspondence with Emily. You're right. Uh, and but you, what you don't know is that the publishers says." In, anything but that, kill the title. And he, said, she, and he said, but give me a couple of weeks. I'll call you back, and I'll get you your title. And he did. Now, this one was only a working title. I wasn't going to call it this. It's just the only title that I had. I don't know how it got there. I don't know. I wasn't too sure about it. And then the publisher just went, yes, that's the title. I'm like, well, I wasn't too sure. What do you think? I mean, I tried to get, get a conversation. I was like, Craig, what do you think? I don't know. I, Steve, what do you think? And, uh, you know, no, no, as soon as they heard it. So it's a weird process. You don't actually have the right. One, one uh, little a moment in my shouting match about blood inside my name. I said, well, what do you want to call it? She said, you know, she, she being from Paris and Long Island, said, just, just you know, one of those southern things you say. I like, you know, you want to hear one of those southern things we say? <laughs> <laughs> Two words. <laughs> yes, Ron. 
maybe it's become because I'm a priest, but when I hear the blood of Emmett Till, I think of Cain and Abel, and I think of God asking Cain, where's your brother? And Cain says, hmm, I don't know. And God says, the blood of your brother is calling out from the ground. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, um, and I found that in uh, Albany, where um, uh, Martin Luther King was, had, they had organized a march, Martin Luther King was gonna lead a march, and he got a, he got slapped with a federal injunction not to do it. So he went to the church in Albany, this church, you know, brimming full of people who were getting ready to go on this march and were looking forward to seeing him. And he comes in and takes the pulpit and explains that they can't march today because he's got, they got an injunction against him. And the federal, it's a federal injunction. Uh, and, and the federal courts have been good to us. And we, we want that to keep on it. And there's a lot of grumbling. And then uh, a Reverend Samuel uh, Wells just basically goes up and steps in front of King and takes the pulpit bodily and says, my blood is being called on the... I, he said, first he says, I ain't got no injunction against me. Do you? Do you? We don't... And he says, my name is being called on the road to freedom. I can hear the blood of Emmett Till as it calls from the ground. When shall we go? Not tomorrow. Not at high noon. Now. And they and leaves them out of the church. Uh, it's a good little, yeah. And of course, it's exactly what he was speaking to. And that kind of stitched it. Somebody else got up. You got one? Did y'all talk be, a little sorry, about it. it's true. going forward? I've heard some wonderful things said about Black Lives Matter and about the place where we're at now. And I was really inspired to learn how energizing, if you will, this horrific tragedy of Till's death was. But here we are in the face of horrific tragedies. Could, could y'all just talk a little bit about whether you see any avenue forward, what kind of avenue forward? Well, you really put your foot in it now. <laughs> okay. okay, 60 seconds. <laughs> and it doesn't start until then. <laughs> Our choice is, is clear. The only road forward is coalition politics. We have to think about power. There is, Martin Luther King said uh, that, that uh, power without love is bankrupt, but that love without power is vacant and sentimental, you know, and that you had to harness love and power toward justice, right? We have to get, we all kind of agree, or almost all of us agree, no matter what faith tradition you come from, political, intellectual tradition, people tend to arrive at, uh, they, they envision a, a social um, ethos grounded in love, fundamentally in the largest sense of the word, on the dignity of human personality, in the, in the uh, importance of, of human need, and, and in the cultivation of human capacity, all in service of, of love in the largest sense. Not just love for your children and your loved ones, but love for people you'll never know. You know, that's, pick your faith and root to the bottom of it. There's, that's what's uh, being called for. And uh, I think that's, that's the ground on which we meet. And that, that uh, we are again up against a river of money, an internationally organized, river of money and all we got is people power and though we so we have to turn to each other and we have to get up like this and what Mamie Till teaches us is not only that that she she made the made a public outcry you know took it to the media right 
Not only that, though, what she did is, and we haven't mentioned the most important character in this book, and that is Black Chicago. Okay? Black Chicago, a quilt is what we need. And a quilt is not something you do by yourself. It is also not something you do when things start to get cold. It's something you do in the summer together, right? And everybody brings the odds and ends of their own necessity and their own past, the things that, they, that brought them here. Yeah, their own stuff. And then we make a quilt out of it. You know? That's what we got to do. What Mamie Till did is she looked at Black Chicago and she saw institutions that had been organized slowly, patiently, over six decades. The Chicago Defender, the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the Johnson Publishing Company, Ebony Jet, and several other national publications, um, the, the uh, International Packing House Workers, United Packing House Workers, who were, it's an inter it was an interracial union with black leadership now, a big, uh, energetic NAACP branch led by labor union militants, all these women's organizations that honeycomb the community. She leveraged all of those inst that institutional power. And that took a lot of people a long time to organize. Right? So we, we need to see what, what are we, what's in our community that we can use and bring that to our, our quilt making. And, and uh, I see that as being, uh, we've got a lot of people shut out and mar we, it's funny, how can, the, how can the majority of people be mar marginalized? It kind of remakes re the meaning of marginalized, but you start looking around, you know, <laughs> somebody, somebody ain't marginalized, but anyway, <laughs> that's an interesting question. But we got people here, Professor Joyner's got seniority on this yeah, question. Uh, no, I don't have seniority. At brains is what I really mean. <laughs> Already mentioned uh, tonight is uh, James Baldwin, and uh, one of uh, my favorite books by him is "No Tell It on the Mountain." Uh, and Mamie Till had the same message when she decided to have the open casket. It was "No Tell It on the Mountain." over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it. Uh, people need to know the news. And the news will inflame them and push them into action. Um, and I think that one of the things that we need to do is uh, go tell it. Go tell that. <laughs> uh, we need to go tell it to other people to help them to understand the gravity of the situation in which we find ourselves today. And out of that, developing some strategy for trying to deal with that. Because in the absence of that, then we become the dried blood of Emmett Till, uh, which we can't afford uh, to do. And, and there are some really threatening things that are occurring today in our environment. Uh, and if we don't deal with them, then we're going to see a return to the days of old. Because this notion of, uh, I want my country back, uh, which is e e exemplified. Uh, in the, the tenor <laughs> that's presented about uh, in this, in this, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. Uh, unless we respond in uh, some strategic manner uh, to oppose what oppression is, uh, is on the way. You know, if I can just add a, put, I want to, I want to give you a concrete uh, rendition of what uh, Professor Joyner just said, which he knows well because he just helped architect this that I'm about to tell you. Okay. 
Pat McCrory comes to office. He has 62% of the votes. 25% of Democrats voted for Pat McCrory. By Inauguration Day, his, his favorables are up, to, as they say, are up to 65%. He then he came to preside over a legislature that was filled with right-wing crackpots uh, and people who believe the purpose of government is to enrich private citizens, starting with them. So um, he signs a bunch of crazy legislation. All spring, he signed crazy legislation. Mo Our newspapers don't have any reporters anymore. They, you know, people didn't know what he was doing. On April 29th, we held the first Moral Monday demonstration. You, we, the press covered it, though not as well as they would. Uh, we, this is part of where, this is where nonviolent direct action comes in. You say, why do you break the law? Why do you get arrested? I said, well, there are, no, I could go into that a lot, but you know, there's a whole moral witness piece. The other thing is, because the press will cover it. And how do you, and the, how do you cover a demonstration without saying what the people are demonstrating about? You don't. It's in there. So, so immediately, people start going, what are they upset about? Uh, damn. That's what they're doing? Okay. Week after week after week. April 29th. Uh, by, by about five weeks later, 65% approval has gone down to 50. That's uh, first of June. By July, 50 has gone down to 40. By September, 40 has gone down to 35. That boy's gone from 65 to 35. His mama won't, didn't, is not going to vote for him. <laughs> the, um, he can't, and the next 39 months, he is, his polls are underwater. Right? Now, and that's what, and this is, there's a public policy polling. Uh, if you Google public policy polling and Moral Monday, You'll get a piece by the director of public policy polling, which is a national and highly regarded polling firm, who writes a chronology of the polling and what's going on that proves that Moral Monday beat Pat McCrory. People are going to tell you, well, finally, we ran a white man from down east to kind of conservative Democrat. That's how we beat prime. That is bullshit, right? Uh, how we beat him was, was by unrelenting uh, publicity of what he was doing and that is what what took him down the only reason that kept, kept that race was even close and he is the by the way he was the only Republican incumbent governor in the United States who could not ride Donald Trump's coattails <laughs> um, the the only reason he was even close is because of the most fortuitously timed hurricane in the history of American politics which all you need is you put on a windbreaker and you go out there and pretend to be loading a truck of bottled water and then you tell the people what to do and where to stay off of and you get to be dad. It's a great political event. It still didn't save him, but anyhow, people say, say, say protest. Well, why don't you, you know, it didn't change any of the votes. Well, you think we thought we were going to change the votes in the legislature? No, 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 no. We don't change the legislature. Starting with the governor. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.